Hello, welcome to Talking Europe. Now, it may be one of the most often quoted claims by European officials facing tough times. Europe will be forged in crisis and will be the sum of the solutions adopted for those crises. Uh, those are the words, obviously, Jean Monnet, one of Europe's founding fathers. He knew that building the European Union would never be a cakewalk. Now, recent history has proven Monet right. From financial crises, global pandemics, to climate calamities, humanitarian disasters, and now a full-fledged war right on Europe's doorstep. Crises are lurking at every turn. Now, managing any one of these might be a daunting challenge. Now, my guest today, uh, Janusz Lenarczyk, doesn't have the luxury to pick and choose his crises. For the past five years, uh, this, this Slovenian diplomat has been Europe's commissioner for crisis management. Now, the job is as wide-ranging as it sounds, and it is relentless as flashpoints erupt in Europe and beyond. Janusz Lenarczyk joins me today. He's via satellite from Brussels, and thank you for being here, sir. A busy man taking some time out. I appreciate it. Good morning. I'm going to cut to the chase because this is the biggest crisis, no matter what we're talking about. All crises these days, all roads lead to climate change and its consequences. The European Commission recently warned, you were among those doing the warning, the EU needs a lot more funding to respond to these climate change-fueled crises. It's the, the aid reserve was exhausted, both in 2021, 2022. Requests for emergency assistance tied to climate, extreme weather events, have gone up 400%. I'm not saying misspeaking, 400% in just the last two years. Are you, are you underwater with this? Do you have even barely the minimum you need to deal with these crises? The fact is that uh, we have never before experienced so many crises uh, in such a short time. Um, and uh, many of them are the consequences of the climate change. We have seen, for instance, the increase by five of the requests for assistance from EU member states and other countries anywhere in the world through our civil protection mechanism in cases of uh, major natural disasters like uh, floods or wildfires or droughts and things like that. And uh, so far we have been able to cope. But the fact is that when we look at the future, we uh, need to understand that this is a new normal. This requires that we adapt and that we pool our resources because one lesson that we have learned over these years of perpetual, constant uh, crisis is that no country on its own is able to cope alone. We need to show solidarity, we need to help each other, and that's why we have this civil protection mechanism at the EU level, which we have been strengthening. But for that, obviously, we need resources. But And this is my question. I mean, you spoke about this when you were first questioned for this job five years ago, back in 2019. You talked about how this would need some sort of integrated ap approach, everyone cooperating, everyone working together. Are you finding that cooperation? Are EU governments all on board? Or are you this commissioner who's constantly on the phone trying to beg for money, trying to convince people this is really urgent? Mm -hmm. It's not only about money. It's also about the capacity, the response capacities. For instance, let's take uh, wildfires. We have seen increasing number of wildfires in, during the fire season, which starts earlier, uh, ends later, and also has spread in geographic terms uh, to areas, parts of Europe, for instance, where in the past you didn't have uh, wildfires, like Central Europe and even Northern Europe. So now uh, we have... Uh, during the fire seasons, fires everywhere. We have fire season that is longer. And uh, even the best equipped member states uh, find themselves in, situ in a situation when their, uh, where their uh, capacities that they have at the national level, uh, like airplanes, uh, firefighters, uh, and so on, are not sufficient. In that case, they turn to us. And then when we receive such a request, and the number of requests has uh, increased five times, as I already mentioned, in the last three, four years, we now um, look to other members 
of this civil protection mechanism, which are EU member states plus several others, we ask them to con contribute their response capacity. So this is the mutual solidarity that works very well. But sometimes we have so many fires at the same time that all the available national capacities are uh, are committed and meaning member states are not in a position to help each other. For that, we need a strategic reserve, a so-called safety net at the European level. And we call that rescue capacity. And right. this rescue capacity has increased. We doubled the number of aircraft for firefighting, for instance, in the <coughs> last couple of years. And uh, for that, of course, we need funding to keep that capacity ready, to keep it on standby and to ensure that it is available when no other capacities are and available. So, OK, so we have the floods in Slovenia in your own country. We've had wildfires in Greece. We've had uh, droughts in Spain. You're also working with Africa, with Latin America um, and beyond. It's not just Europe. I want to Yet there's another front where we have crises. I spoke about wars and conflicts. We have the, in Gaza right now. The EU recently said that it is going to step up its aid, 125 million euros, I believe, to the Palestinians in Gaza. That doesn't seem nearly enough, but even beyond that, how are you trying to get that aid to the Palestinians in the, the, the Palestinian occupied territory? How are you getting in? The trucks aren't getting in, or at least not enough of them. First of all, the humanitarian needs have exploded. The number of people worldwide who need humanitarian aid has more than doubled compared to the uh, years before the mandate of the current commission. So only in the, f in the last four or five years, the number of humanitarian um, needs, the, 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 the uh, level of humanitarian need needs has, has more than doubled. And the funding has not. You know, we have more or less a fixed uh, budget. We are getting some reinforcements uh, here and there. Uh, but we have increasing difficulty to cope, which calls for greater efforts, uh, not only from EU, which is already uh, among the three biggest donors of the humanitarian aid, but also from some other uh, countries in the world that um, could and should contribute more for this, but, but which I believe is a global Specifically, I'm sorry, but specifically with Gaza, um, how are you responding to what is being yeah, described as one of the world's worst most giant humanitarian crises right now of, of, of the moment. Gaza is just the latest. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, the latest humanitarian catastrophe that we are dealing with. Uh, but we have been in Gaza and in Palestinian territories since uh, more than 20 years ago. And we have been providing humanitarian aid to Palestinians who needed it already for all this time. With the uh, escalation of violence and the Israeli uh, military response to the Hamas terror attack, of course, this situation has dramatically deteriorated. And now we have uh, practically entire population of Gaza, more than 2 million people, who are in terrible catastrophic humanitarian situation. Not only we have more than 25,000 people dead, uh, many more uh, injured and wounded, we have almost the entire population that is going hungry, that is going thirsty, that is uh, <clears throat> living in squalid conditions, in overcrowded shelters and so on. So the situation is dramatic. That's why we have, we, the European Union, we have immediately quadrupled our humanitarian aid last year, and we have already allocated for this year an initial allocation of one, more than 125 million euros. In addition, we have provided in-kind assistance through the humanitarian air bridge that we have launched immediately after the most, this most recent escalation. Now, uh, what we have been able to do so far is still not enough because uh, there are uh, several obstacles on, uh, with regard to the getting of the assistance into Gaza and even more so distributing it throughout Gaza. Why? First of all, there are not enough entry points. We basically have two at the moment, Rafa from Egypt and Kerem Shalom from Israel, and both are not yet enough. Uh, the, the amount of aid that is so, coming I, into Gaza is not enough. You can't, no, let, me just, let me just cut you off because I understand that the aid can't get into Gaza, but even Gaza aside, uh, you 
you had the problems with Ukraine, getting power generators to Ukraine, getting other assistance to Ukraine. Are, are you, do you pri prioritize one of these conflicts over another? Is Gaza right now more important than Ukraine, vice versa? No. no. We, uh, we, the European Union, we are a global humanitarian donor. For us, human life is of equal value anywhere in the world. So one, what, we, what, we, what happens when there are a multiplication of crises, when additional, a new humanitarian crisis erupts, like uh, Gaza uh, since October last year, we reallocate funding, we look into our reserves. Uh, but yes, with the increasing needs, there is less for each individual crisis, uh, but there is no other way. But we approach every crisis and every humanitarian need, every human being that needs uh, assistance, that needs, um, uh, that needs humanitarian aid equally. So we distribute what we have, we tap our reserves, uh, we sometimes get additional transfers from other parts of the budget, we get some contributions, extra contributions from member states occasionally, so we try to cope. But our main principle is we, as a global humanitarian donor, treat every crisis equally. We don't prioritize crisis. We don't prioritize humanitarian needs in any terms, be, be it uh, geographically or politically or what have you. For us, the only criteria upon which we decide on allocation of our humanitarian funding is the needs as assessed by credible humanitarian partners and also ourselves. Inashe Lenarchic, uh, we are actually out of time, and I haven't, I still had about 120 crises that I wanted to talk to you about. I think we're going to have to unfortunately save that for another day. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today about the daunting challenges Europe's facing in these times of climate crisis, war, and dire humanitarian need. We'll be back here on Talking Europe with the debate in just a few minutes.